We make statements about it, but as a reality, it has nothing to do with us at all. The author of those words was the great 20th century theologian, Karl Rahner. And by it, he was referring, of course, to the Trinity, the three-in-one configuration of creator, redeemer, sustainer, father, son, and spirit that we confessed in our creed just a few moments ago. Rahner, a Roman Catholic, was not aiming his critique at heaven when he wrote those words in 1967. Rather, he was wondering how such a uniquely configured God, three in one, diversity within unity, could be so continuously disregarded by believing Christians. It's as though this mystery has been revealed for its own sake, Rahner continues and that even after it has been made known to us, it remains as a reality locked up within itself. I think that many people would prefer to leave the Trinity right there, locked up. For one thing, it cuts against the grain of how we understand the universe to work. It cuts against the grain of our usual understandings of authority and agency. God, during my own childhood, looked something like this. An immense white bearded man on his heavenly throne. The sock puppet on his right hand was the sun. The sock puppet on his left hand was the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he spoke through one. Sometimes he spoke through the other. But the Father the Father was always in control. I couldn't piece it together any other way. Doesn't someone have to be first, after all? Doesn't someone always have to be in control, like my own father, with his hands perennially on the steering wheel? Now, it's not as if I spent a great deal of time obsessing about this configuration when I was 10 or 11 or 12. Rahner's words about the Trinity more or less summed it up to me. We make statements about it, but as a reality, it has nothing to do with us at all. I understood that we had a God in three parts. It just didn't matter to me. It certainly didn't have any implications for how I should be living. Later, other images were shown to me. St. Patrick with his shamrock. The clever configuration of ice, water, and steam. Get it? <laughs> Tertullian, the great third century mystic in Carthage, imagined the Trinity thusly. God as the invisible root system, Christ himself as the stem and blossom, the Holy Spirit as the fragrance wafting about. I took it all in. I kept moving. Why does the Trinity matter? What are its implications? As I think about the Trinity now, this threefold God, I see it primarily as a community. As a community. Rahner would say three modes of subsisting in one person. A community that holds together by containing diversity within itself. The Trinity is not controlled by God the Father, but exists as three interdependent beings, interdependent and independent. As theologians say, each of three modes co-eternal. Not one mode first at the table, not one mode excluded, dominated, or subservient. And perhaps this is why the Trinity matters. Perhaps here are the implications for our own living. Karl Barth, who with Rahner more or less defined 20th century Christian theology, wrote that, quote, the real beginning of Christian service is when we see ourselves completely linked to the other with no remnant 
of superiority. Completely linked to the other with no remnant of superiority. We identify with others and want to help them, not because they represent opportunities for us to do good or to give back, but because we know that they and that we are human together because we are in need of God's help, all of us, together. We hear this message in the letter to the Hebrews. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. No remnant of superiority here. Instead, what animates us, what drives us, is a sense of solidarity and unity within diversity a diversity that never becomes exclusion, three distinct modes of being within one God. The Trinity, I think, far from being a mystery locked within itself, models for us a particular way of living. And we glorify God when we are in a pattern of action that parallels God's decision to be with us and for us, with us and for us in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to be for one another as God the Creator is for us through Christ in the power of the Spirit, completely linked to the other with no remnant of superiority. Far from being a reality that has nothing to do with us at all, the Trinity is pointing us towards salvation. When in 1988, our own diocesan Episcopal elections rocked the Anglican Communion through the selection of an African-American woman, Barbara C. Harris, as our bishop, the model of the Trinity, diversity without exclusion, was what we were living into the Trinity informed the Anglican Communion's Virginia Report, which provided theological justification for the full participation of women at the highest levels of leadership in our churches. When on the first Sunday in Advent of 2009, our diocesan bishop, Tom Shaw, permitted but did not compel clergy in our diocese to officiate at the marriages of same-sex couples, he wrote in his pastoral letter to us that he understood this as a means by which we would together live more fully into, and I quote, Christ's ethic of love. Diversity without exclusion. We're always running, aren't we, to catch up with God's radical inclusiveness. The Trinity, after all, is a configuration where no one party lives in greater esteem than anyone else, where no one triumphs at the expense of another. This is the God of love and peace that Paul mentions as he closes his last letter to the Corinthians this morning. What Paul implies, what Christ implies in Matthew's Gospel is this idea that became more fully formulated in the age of the great church councils of the 300s and the 400s, that God existed not as an individual being, but as the dynamic and fluid exchange of perfect love between creator, redeemer, and sustainer. God is love, not loving. God is love itself because God is relationship. As Paul says in the Acts of the Apostles, in God we live and move and have our being. That's what this famous image here, the Rublev icon, written in the early 1400s, attempts to show us. I apologize if you can't see it from here, 
but it's hanging right in front of the pulpit. It's an image of three around a table. Unity within diversity, no one at the head of the table, but living, movement, and being, not locked up within itself as Rahner feared, but actually open. Now to spend time with this icon, to pray with it, is to realize that this configuration of three is incomplete without you at the table. There is a certain pull, isn't there, towards the table edge facing you at the front of the scene. Those who have seen the actual icon, and it is quite large, in Moscow, tell me that the draw of the viewer in toward the front edge of the table is unmistakable, palpable. That its invitation is to live the love and not simply to proclaim the doctrine. That we actually come close to God by bellying up. That is intentionally engaging with the people and the planet around us by sitting down with those who differ from us. Diversity without exclusion. I think this is why healthy churches are always so much more than enclaves of like-minded people. This is why great cities combine races, creeds, tongues, genders, and sexual orientations in a way that makes all of us new. Instead of water, steam, and ice, the three-part plant, an image of the Trinity that I have been sitting with lately is an image set forth, perhaps unconsciously, by the writer J. Anthony Lucas in his classic 1985 study of the city of Boston common ground. If you've read this book, you know that it tells the searing, tragic, beautiful, and earth-shaking story of the city of Boston as it struggled to desegregate its public schools through court-ordered busing. Lucas did something incredible in the telling of this story. He chose to tell it through the personal, deeply personal experiences of three families. The Irish McGuff family of Charlestown, the African-American Twyman family of Lower Roxbury, and the Yankee Diver family of the South End. Joan and Colin Diver, whose story is made known in common ground, are members of our parish to this day. The thing about common ground the thing about it that evokes the Trinity for me is that in this swirl of three, each are opened up. It's messy, it's inconclusive, and as we all know, it did not solve the problem of racial discrimination in our city. But through and around and in between those terrible years, the Holy Spirit was at work opening this city up, making it and us new. This is why in this movement, mission matters so much to us. A trip to Kenya, an afternoon at Rosie's Place, an evening at the Pine Street Inn. It's not about us helping someone out there, someone we believe to be in some way underprivileged. It's rather about living fully into the icon that we see here, into its image of love, a free-flowing exchange that transforms everyone at the table. You know this if you have ever done mission work. Perhaps you've gone into it with some image of yourself as I have, as the provider, the saving person, some notion of earning an invisible but eternal badge.
of merit. But you come away from the work not thinking of those things at all. You come away having been fed and loved yourself. That it has been less about saving and more about having put yourself in a place where God, who is love, has been at work on you in a particular transforming way, strengthening you, renewing you, even relaxing you. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Solace and strength, pardon and renewal. Today, Trinity Sunday, love bids you welcome in a particular way. Love refuses to remain locked up within itself. Will you refuse that temptation too? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.